Hello and welcome to Worlds Apart. It's a plot that seems unrealistic even by Hollywood standards. Russia and the United States they get so frustrated with each other that their diplomatic communication is cut to bare minimum until one famous actor makes a couple of calls here and there and sets everything in motion. Well, Steven Seagal played that role in real life and he joins us now on Worlds Apart. Mr. Seagal, thank you very much for your time. Now, one of the first guests on the show was um, Dana Rohrabacher, a senator from California uh, who came to Moscow in June and he was investigating uh, suspects, looking for information about suspects in the Boston Marathon bombing. But he told me back then that that trip wouldn't have been possible without your participation. How did you become such an unlikely cultural ambassador for the two countries? <clears throat> I think that Dana and I have been friends for a long time, and uh, he knew of my relationship with Russia for a long, long time. Uh, he knows that I go back in Russia a long time and that I have a lot of friends here, some of whom are very powerful and influential. But he also believes that I have insight into the culture, the heart of Russia, and the people who are running the country in some ways, that's his opinion anyway. We were both concerned about not only the Boston bombings, but anti-terrorism or terrorism in general. And um, he asked me if uh, I had any opinions on this. And I said, well, I believe that really uh, Fezbe, and Spetsnaz uh, are some of the world's leading experts on, on, on terrorism. And I believe that uh, there's a reason for that. And it's because, you know, from, from before Beslan, through Beslan up until now, Russia has had to deal with some of the most horrific acts of terrorism in the history of mankind. But what do you think it really says about the nature of relationship between these two countries, the world's greatest powers with some of the largest talks of nuclear weapons when even basic communication uh, was impossible without uh, participation of somebody like you who is not involved in politics, you are not part of the government. I think that what happened here is Dana said to me, the last time I asked the CIA to provide me with people and answers, they gave me people and answers that answered my questions the way they wanted it to be answered, meaning the CIA. And the same with the State Department. Dana knew that I knew the right people in Russia, and he knew that I would get them to tell him the truth. And we all feel, Dana and I feel, that Russia and America have never fought each other in a war. We believe that Russia and America should be best friends. And we believe that many of the people in America love Vladimir Putin, we believe that many of the people in America love Russia. We believe that many of the people in America are not going along with the hocus pocus of certain governmental bodies who want to try to perpetuate the Cold War. We believe that the Cold War is a fantasy and a hoax to perpetuate maybe some sort of financial gain uh, here and there for certain individuals. And we think that the only way to really create world balance and world power and, and, and peace in the world is if America and Russia become brothers and best friends. And that's my mission in life, is to get better relationships between Russia and America and keep them good. Now, you mentioned that you have uh, quite a few powerful friends in Russia, and you also mentioned Vladimir Putin's name already. It's not a secret that you know each other personally. Um, how well do you know each other? Gosh, I, I, I want to be polite and say that I probably don't know him very well. I, I would like to think that I know him well. Um, but suffice it to say that I know him well enough to know that he is one of the greatest world leaders, if not the greatest world leader alive today. He cares more about Russia than anybody I know. And he's not afraid to stand up and do what needs to get done. Interesting. Now, the two of you share an affinity for martial arts. He has a black belt in judo. You have a seventh dan black belt in Aikido. Does it mean that you would have a similar life philosophy? I mean, I'm not really sure whether or not him and I agree on everything. I'm sure we don't. I know that he has studied Eastern philosophies. Uh, the first time I went to his home, I 
walked in and saw a life-size statue of Kano Jigoro, uh, who is the founder of Judo. So I was immediately, you know, taken and impressed and, you know, sort of really uh, wanting to get to know this man deeper and deeper. Um, he, he is a student of uh, Asian philosophy, but he's also a student of, you know, medieval, you know, great leaders and great tacticians. He's, he's a smart man who studies those people who have had amazing results in history. Now, I used to cover Kremlin politics, and I remember President Putin making a lot of references to judo to explain his political uh, strategy, his political views. And when you look at his very long presence in the Russian politics, it, it indeed looks like a series of judo matches because he he's very uh, patient, he has perseverance, he studies his opponents carefully, he waits out for the right moment. Uh, what do you think about this political strategy? Because some people feel that it's way too calculated. Well, first of all, the main goal in life is to win. And uh, it is good to be calculating, it is good to be patient, it is good to be able to wait for the right timing because timing is everything. Um, I was raised in Asia, I was raised studying tactics, and I think that this makes him the great politician he is. I think in this recent debacle where, you know, President of the United States, you know, wanted to bomb Syria, I, I think the whole world saw who was the senior statesman, more diplomatic, uh, more intelligent and, and, and more caring about, you know, uh, the human dilemma. But um, as commendable as that may be, it also sometimes used against your own country, especially now when uh, the United States and Russia have a somewhat tenuous relationship. Some people at home may call you unpatriotic for saying something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, I love America. I'm not unpatriotic in any way, shape or form. There are regimes, you know, I may have loved Reagan, I may have loved Kennedy, I may have loved many of the presidents, but right now the regime that we have, uh, uh, myself, Congressman Rohrabacher, many of the Republican Party, we don't agree with a lot of things that, that President Obama is doing. I didn't agree with bombing Syria, and that's all I'm saying. You got a lot of sneering and negative press for your engagements here in Russia, especially for your public appearances with Putin, even though they weren't explicitly political, you were just supporting sports and trying to engage young people in martial arts. But why do you think Western press is so critical of um, the ties between the two of you? Because you have to understand whether or not it is intelligent or ethical or moral, one of the great techniques of even Adolf Hitler, uh, and he talked about his propaganda masters, and there's that uh, you know, age-old adage of tell a lie enough times and it becomes the truth. One of the things that you know, uh, certain people's regime has become very adept at is controlling the press and controlling the media and controlling, for example, I'll, I'll say it right here, CNN. Do I think CNN is, you know, completely telling it like it is? No. I think they have an agenda. I think their agenda is, is bought and paid for. That's what I think. And so, you know, I'm seeing CNN constantly slamming Putin, and in some ways th th they, they don't even say not only the facts, but they come out and say complete lies. And I will stand up to their face and say that. And, and so this isn't about who's telling the truth, who's right or who's wrong. It's about a smear campaign and who can manipulate uh, uh, the, the press. Now, I, I think you took uh, even more heat for uh, your public appearances with another Russian leader, and that is Ramzan Kadyrov, the president of Chechnya. And he's, of course, a controversial figure, not just in the West, but also here in Russia. What do you see in him? Okay, I have said this over and over and over and over and over again. If he gets indicted, if somebody makes, you know, legal and official charges against him, I want to know about it right away. Every single president I know, and I know many, there are rumors about all of them. Every single one of them, including Obama. There are criminal, you know, uh, allegations against him. You know, criminal. Uh, the, the, there are many allegations against many of the different presidents. Hey, uh, is Ramzan Kadyrov a war criminal? Is he really? If he is, show me something that rises above wild conjecture and speculation. 
Okay? Show me something that, that, that is proof that he really committed war crimes or did anything that, that, you know, is criminal. When I got together with Congress in an official congressional delegation, we talked about Ramzan. We talked about Chechnya. And I said, guys, give me what you have. Some of the stuff that they said, they, they, before they would even tell it to me, they said, it is wild. It is crazy. It is, and, and when I heard it, it was even wilder and crazier. I mean... Uh, do I believe any of that? No. Did Congress believe it? No. Now, uh, when you mention Chechnya to average Americans, uh, they immediately think of war, destruction, probably human rights abuses. Uh, and you've been there in Chechnya. I'm sure you had some preconceptions before your visit. What struck you about that region of Russia? I mean, the way I looked at it was that there may have been a time where Ramzan was fighting against Russia, I'm told there was. Is that true? Absolutely, yeah, okay. there was. And he was fighting for what he considered to be his country and his people. But there came a point where the war was over, where Ramzan and Vladimir Putin got together and made an agreement. My understanding was that at that point, Ramzan said, any terrorists in my country will either leave or be killed, and I and my people will be the first to kill them because we do not believe in terrorism. We do not believe in anything like that anymore. So keeping that in mind, you know, we have to understand that life changes in, as regimes change, even in America, and even in big, you know, first world, you know, countries, life, politics, the way people think, the way people do things completely change. I thought that Ramzan was a great example of how it should be where at one time somebody's somebody's enemy and they become our friends and they become our allies. And if you look at Groznia, which was leveled, was it seven, eight years ago? Yeah. And you look at it now, it is thriving, flourishing, clean, wonderful, Islamic city where there seems to be complete peace and order. That's a good example. And it's an example that everyone should look at rather than what did he do 10, 15 years ago. You mentioned Syria before. It's interesting to compare these two regions because uh, Syria is the country that is being leveled now and uh, the leadership of Syria is being very harshly criticized by the American leadership. Do you think it is possible to mend those ties and look at the situation with, uh, through your lenses? I, I think it's absolutely possible to, to mend any fence, number one. Number two, I'm not prepared to make a comment on what's happening in Syria because in America, I don't believe we are being told the whole truth. And I don't know if anybody is. I don't know even, even what the Russian people are being told. I, I feel completely confused by the information that I'm getting. I mean, one minute it seems as though uh, 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 you have terrorists and the same terrorists, and I'm calling them terrorists on purpose, the same terrorists were in Libya, then, then, then you know, those same guys were then in Cairo, and then those same guys are now uh, in, in, in Syria calling themselves Syrian. It's a little bit mysterious to me. Now, you, you seem to have a very uh, cosmopolitan and open-minded, at least, view of the world, and maybe that's due to your experience, due to your uh, current engagements, but... Um, while you seem to be accepting and tolerant of cultural differences, does it ever come into conflict with your sense of justice and morality? Because it's very much in the American ethos to spread the American values around the world, and you don't seem to be doing that very explicitly. I don't believe in that at all. I don't believe in you know, spreading American ethos anywhere. I think that all people should believe in their own religious beliefs, their own culture, their own traditions, and they have a right to believe in that. And, and I don't try to impose any of my own feelings or views on anybody for anything. Now, we have to take a short break now, but when we come back, he often played law enforcement officers on the big screen, but what made Steven Seagal give 20 years to police service in real life? That's coming up in a few moments on Worlds Apart. Welcome back to Worlds Apart, where we are discussing life and movies with Steven Seagal. Mr. Seagal, you know, just the other day I was interviewing another Steve, Steve Bosniak, a co-founder of Apple, and he's somebody uh, who became uh, a multimillionaire very quickly, but even after that, he's 